creating flat characters, stock characters. Uh, these are part of narrative strategy, you can say, or strategy of the author. But when the situation becomes something like there is absolutely no round character, all the characters are stock characters. It happens in case of fairy tales. Think about fairy tales. Where are the round characters there? Then that becomes a problem. And that's why there are so many adaptations to them. Hello and welcome back to Nimble Pop. Today in this video, we are going to talk in details about characters in fiction. Often you struggle with writing answers on characterization or writing answers on any particular character in a novel or short story or even drama. After this video, you will know about different kinds of characters, how they are categorized and this is also going to be very important if you are attempting questions on literary terms. Don't skip any part of this video because the character types that I'm going to discuss today are very much linked to each other. If you find this video useful, please subscribe to our channel and share with your friends to show your support. This is Monami Mukherjee. Welcome once again. We all know what character means in fiction. Usually, the human beings or any other beings who are used to progress the story, okay? They are the characters. Characters may be entirely uh, imagined by the author or they may be based on real life. Now, in order to make our discussion more focused, we will look at characters in fiction on the basis of three ways of categorization. First, we will categorize characters based on the roles they play in the story, okay? Then we will look at the nature or quality of characters and will categorize them. And third, we will look at their development. So based on development, change in characters, we will be looking at the third way of categorizing it, all right? So first we will focus on categorizing characters. How many types of characters are there in a story based on the role that a character plays in a story? Now, based on role, we can roughly categorize characters into uh, four or maybe five types. The most important one being the protagonist. Then comes the antagonist, then the foil, and eventually we'll have uh, deuteragonist and tertiary characters. So, first we will look at protagonists, what protagonists are and why are they called so. Now, the word protagonist is linked to the word agon. Now, back in the classical age, when there were these tournaments and competitions, uh, these games were called agon. It was the, you can see the war field of the competitors and the principal person, uh, the champion you can say, who faced the challenges of that agon was called the protagonist, okay? So therefore, the word protagonist in fiction means the character who acts as the focus of the story or who is the main character of the story. A protagonist can be a male figure or a female figure and sometimes uh, in very uh, rare cases of course there are these special kinds of fiction. Protagonists are non-human figures even, okay. The story acts and centers around how these protagonists think and act and the way their character develops in the story. The usual trajectory or what you can say the arc of a protagonist uh, covers uh, this whole uh, range from exposition to facing a certain kind of a conflict or a contradiction, then making a choice, exercising their choice and eventually going to a resolution if possible or some crisis if that resolution is not a good one for them. 
and then there is a realization and there is always a redeeming thing about protagonist you know no matter how badly they act at the end of the story or novel uh, there is a kind of redeeming quality something good we associate with the protagonist all right obviously the readers empathize with this character they identify at times with this character because the whole story is set you know from the perspective of the protagonist now when i say perspective if you have watched my previous video on narrative style you would know that uh, well a story can be written in third person uh, in first person uh, from omniscient point of view from limited point of view but the point of view of the character which dominates all other points of view is you can say the point of view of the protagonist that's the main character and of course the principal part of the plot is occupied by this character you see this character uh, more than any other characters in the story um, if you talk about examples there are so many examples let me just give you one or two um, marlo in heart of darkness he is the protagonist because he not only narrates the story or a part of the story to us but he also experiences a lot of conflict a lot of uh, situations where he goes through certain realizations gets to us a picture of a world uh, which he describes through his eyes so marlo is the protagonist of heart of darkness jane in jane eyre now when it comes to novels where the novels are named after a person usually it is seen that the person whose name is the novel uh, is the protagonist for example in oliver twist in david copperfield you don't have any guessing games here you know who the protagonist is because the name of the novel tells you the harry potter series it tells you that harry is the protagonist of this whole series same is the case with alice in alice in wonderland now is this protagonist always a good person well based on what the protagonist does we can you can subdivide this category into two categories hero and anti hero all right so who is a hero the word hero is derived from heracles which is the greek word for hercules traditionally archetypal heroes um, they are based on this idea of strength courage um, wisdom because those are the things that we associate with hercules now the novel being a fairly modern victorian kind of a genre we see a lot of shift from that idea of uh, physical strength to the idea of mental strength and um, handling of conflict all these things you know the point about being a hero has become associated with making choices and not just having physical strength okay so hero in modern post modern in even victorian fiction they may or may not possess physical strength but they certainly exercise the right kind of choice take for example harry potter right from the beginning he is exercising his choice uh, he chooses to be in gryffindor because he thinks that slytherin Uh, houses uh, devils and people will, with evil ideas so this is the way he exercises his choice to be good and eventually that determines how his life changes over time and how he raises to that stature of the hero all right and um, usually uh, in case of traditional fiction uh, the hero undertakes a journey now it has become like uh, maybe it's an inward journey it's not always an actual journey that a hero undertakes um a very good example uh, is uh, shorochandra srikanto okay it's a bengali uh, novel again a series you can say where we see the protagonist uh, he is showing his entire life and is actually physically moving from place to place and at the same time it's like a mental journey he is undertaking so hero of fiction may or may not actually go through a journey marlo goes through a journey real journey into the heart of africa you will have nonetheless a kind of a journey and that journey is going to make this person 
reach a point of realization. Maybe he will make mistakes or she will make mistakes on the way, but there will be this realization. And in every action, even in the mistakes, we see that the intention is always good. So that is the real quality of a hero. So a hero is, as Aristotle had defined, a basically good human being. Now, maybe we will have a very separate session on a tragic hero defined by Aristotle, but this is hero in fiction. This is also the same thing. A person who exercises the right kind of choice with the right kind of intention. All right. Antihero. Now, does antihero mean he is villain? No. Antihero means this is also a protagonist, the central character, the focus character in the story, but he or she does not uh, correlate with or it does not match with the usual expectations people have from heroes. So, readers are not comfortable with these, uh, these characters. Maybe they are uh, loners who do not mix with others. All right. So, they have some bad habit which the readers can't identify with. All right. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, he used to consume cocaine. So, of course, he cannot be heroic in that sense. He is an anti-hero because he is definitely the central character in, uh, in Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, books. So, we can say loners and mentally challenged people, people who have a different kind of idea about ethics and morality or just personality, you know, they may be very satirical, cynical, you cannot socially accommodate them, you cannot talk to them uh, for long without feeling bad and frustrated. Uh, think about uh, Jimmy Potter in Osborne's Look Back in Anger, who who dominate the, the fiction or the, or the novel or the story, but there is something which the readers find disturbing in the characters. They appear shady at times, but they are still protagonists. Uh, Macbeth, okay, see Macbeth, what, what does he actually do? He turns into a serial killer, but at the end of it, with his moment of realization, then, then he says that, okay, everything is nothing and I shouldn't have trusted those weird sisters. In that moment, he redeems himself. We maybe begin to have some kind of sympathy that, okay, this man uh, made a mistake and has realized it. So at that point, Macbeth ceases to be a villainous character and he becomes an anti-hero, you can say. Scarlet O'Hara in Gone with the Wind, she is an amazing example of anti-hero. You know, she does things, she makes compromises, which is not always morally admissible, at least not in context of, of the times when she was living. But why does she do this? She does this to eventually find happiness, to eventually make her life worth living. And therefore, she is not a villain, of course. She is an anti-hero. Heathcliff in Wuthering Heights. If you have read Wuthering Heights, you would be so moved by the character of Heathcliff. And still, if I ask you, would you like a person like Heathcliff in your life? You would definitely have second thoughts. That is an anti-hero. A person who we admire from a distance. But we do not want that person in our lives. Okay, so that is anti-hero. But that is the main character in the story. The end of it, there is a redemption given to it. There is a point where we wish to forgive things which we don't like about that character. All right. Uh, antagonist. Antagonist is a villain. To be very precise, antagonist is the opposing force. All right. This opposing force can be a human being. It can be circumstance, fate. It can be something which is there inside the main character's heart. Something which pulls him back. Something which opposes him. Because all of us, we have, uh, you know, these conflicts inside us which sometimes eat us away. That is our antagonist. So, antagonist need not be a character. 
So what is the difference between anti-hero and antagonist? Anti-hero is the protagonist, the main character. Antagonist is not the main character but an opposing force. Anti-hero is almost always a human being or at least a living being whereas anti-hero is more often than not a human being at least a living being but an antagonist may or may not be a human being at all it can be an abstract idea even let's look at some of the antagonists that you know of if you have watched the film batman the second part the joker is the antagonist a very powerful character which uh, kind of really moves us but at the same time it's an opposing force to the hero batman the Batman is again an anti-hero. Why? Because he does not possess all the qualities of a hero. We feel disturbed by things that are hidden in him, which uh, gets revealed as the series goes on. So he's not technically an, a, a pristine hero. There are shades in him. But this Joker is definitely the antagonist. Lord Voldemort in Harry Potter. Some events are described to us to show his childhood, to, uh, to justify his position. But no matter what Voldemort says about the reasons he has, he remains the antagonist. Then what about Harry? Is he a hero or is he an anti-hero? He is definitely a hero. Why? Because he doesn't realize till the end that he carries within him a part of Voldemort. The moment he realizes, he gets rid of that in a way. So all the darkness in Harry, whatever darkness was there, was because of that small little bit of Voldemort which remains stuck inside him. So he is a hero where he faces two antagonists. One is Lord Voldemort, the real physical presence of an antagonist and that small little part of Voldemort's soul which lay inside him, which is nothing but his own persona, a part of himself acting as the antagonist. So when you have very complicated or complex characters, more often than not, the antagonist is not outside but inside the characters. And how they fight against their own demons, that becomes the story. This is very evident in, in, in stories like the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, when Mr. Hyde is the dark character and Dr. Jekyll uh, is the uh, is a protagonist you can see and is the same person this is a case of schizophrenia split personality and Dr. Jekyll is fighting actually against his own self without even realizing right Robinson Crusoe who is the antagonist in Robinson Crusoe Robinson Crusoe is alone on an island uh, apparently he has no antagonist. Some people might say the sea is his antagonist, but no, the sea is just a situation. The main antagonist is his loneliness. And because his loneliness, his isolation is his antagonist, how does he fight it? You know, he tries to add companionship in his life, even within that small island. So, protagonist constantly raises a fight against the antagonist. If the antagonist is inside his own mind, then he fights against his own mind. Otherwise, it's a fight where he actually slays monsters and dragons. Foil. Foil usually makes us remember the thing which we wrap our food in. Okay. So how is that related to it? It's not related to it, but I feel like this. Suppose you wrap a burger in a foil and then you slowly take the burger away. The foil still looks like a burger, okay? Because it has uh, kind of adapted to the shape of the burger, but it is not a burger. Foil is the same thing. When a character is somehow parallel to the protagonist. There are things which you can connect between the two but acts in a different way, makes a different kind of choices, lives a different kind of life. 
that is called a foil. Banco, take for example. I am giving examples from drama, although we are having this session um, in fiction, because um, drama also has these things. So, and you have read more plays than novels uh, in your syllabus, so it becomes easier for you to understand. Look at Banco and Macbeth. Both are you know, soldiers, they are brave, both are loved by the king, both are friendly with each other, in fact very much friendly with each other when the play begins. But through the course of the play, in fact the witches make prophecy to both of them. But as the play progresses, we see how they act on those prophecies are different. Banco acts in no way which is similar to Macbeth's action. So in making different kind of choice, these foil characters, Banco is a foil to Macbeth, these foil characters establish their difference from the main character and makes us focus on those characters in the main character or protagonist. Sometimes the foil uh, character is a better human being than the main character. Sometimes a foil character is a uh, worse human being than the main character. It doesn't always have to be a better human being to become a foil. Take for example, Damon Wildeef in The Return of the Native is a foil to Clem O'Bride. He has certain parallels with Clem, but he is completely a different person when it comes to making certain choices in life. Again, we have Heathcliff and Edgar Linton in Wuthering Heights, where Edgar Linton is a, you can say, a weaker version of Heathcliff. Um, so, Foyle is in a way a secondary character. It is not, of course, the primary character. Uh, who are the primary characters? The protagonist, the antagonist. The Foyle is always the secondary character. Now, when it comes to secondary character, you should know this term. Deuteragonist. Deu means two. Two means secondary. Uh, a foil may or may not be a deuteragonist. Deuteragonist means second most important character. If you say who is the second most important character in Macbeth, Lady Macbeth. It's not Banco. A deuteragonist is often a very close companion of the protagonist. Think about Harry Potter. Harry is the protagonist, Lord Voldemort is the antagonist. The second most important character just after Harry is of course Ron Weasley. Although Hermione uh, is a very good competitor of this position. But yes, if you talk about companionship, Harry and Ron, they share a, a far closer companionship because well, they are boys and they grew up together. So, they find more things in common than with Hermione. Now, Ron is also a foil to Harry. He has certain traits which are parallel to Harry and certain things which he does differently. All right. So, Ron is both a foil and a deuteragonist. Whereas, Dr. Watson in Sherlock Holmes stories, uh, he is basically not a foil at all. He has nothing to connect himself with uh, Sherlock Holmes. But he is definitely a deuteragonist because he is a constant companion. Now, when a writer uh, writes a novel or a long story, then uh, there are many other characters uh, other than these, all right? And they are usually minor characters or tertiary characters, all right? Now, we will come to the, the second method of categorization, which is based on the quality or nature of the characters. Now, based on the quality or nature, you can say we have three kinds of characters, flat characters, round characters and stock characters. All right. So, pay very close attention because uh, this is very tricky at times. Let us look at flat characters. The word flat itself tells us it is one dimensional. So, a character who does not have a lot of complexity, only one or two traits you can describe the character maybe in one or two sentences. That is a flat character. They are used to fulfill a specific role. Um, they do not usually act as the principal character or main character because there is no development at all. There is no emotional depth. In many of Charles Dickens's novels, we have these flat characters. One who can be described in one or two sentences 
and the writer he doesn't spend much time describing their characters too and there is something very robotic about it something very mechanical not real not human enough E.M. Foster in aspects of the novel uh, he discussed some features of flat characters and he just defines it as a flat character is a simple character shown by the author as having just one or two qualities which generally remain the same throughout the story so that is the main focus here all right the audience doesn't know much about them because the writer chooses not to describe them a lot they are mostly uh, you know these supporting characters you can see um, miss modi from to kill a mockingbird and uh, Mr. Collins from Pride and Prejudice and interestingly there are many protagonists or principal figures or main characters who sometimes are flat characters. Think about the detectives Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Poirot. They are super intelligent, all right, emotionally cold. And there is absolutely no development in character. They don't change at all. They are so flat that when you think that somebody is super intelligent, you call him a Sherlock Holmes. So they become like these adjectives, you know, they, they, they become a symbol in a way. So flat characters uh, may be very important in the novel or the story, but nonetheless, they are one dimensional they do not have emotional depth and they are not real enough you can almost predict what they will do when Sherlock Holmes is there in a story you can almost predict that he's going to solve the case so in a way we can say that flat characters are created by the writers to fill in the spaces uh, because it's not possible for a writer to create um, three-dimensional characters um, throughout the stories that takes a lot of time and energy and it, it shifts our focus away. Now when there are uh, some flat characters in a story uh, and we, we do not think that they are interesting enough as characters, then the character which is not a flat character will take all our attention so the focus shifts therefore the flat characters also serve to make us focus on the non-flat characters stock character sometimes students get confused between flat characters and stock characters stock character is also you can say a stereotype stereotype means something uh, which is very much predictable but here the word stock has to be kept in mind stock means something which exists in different kinds of stories before this story is written in which this character appears suppose you are a writer and you want to write a fiction or a story or a novel then you will of course create some characters but how many original characters can you create? More often than not, you will end up adding characters in your story who are usually presented in the same way by all authors or most authors. The terrible stepmother, the tortured, starving artist, the outlaw, the hopeless romantic, these are the characters who have same kind of features whenever they appear in stories. There is a very thin line between stock characters and flat characters. And the funny part is this, flat characters, when they are used over time, they turn into stock characters. When Sherlock Holmes was first created, Hercule Poirot was created, they were not stock characters because there was no instance of anybody like Sherlock Holmes before. So at that time, Sherlock Holmes was a flat character. But nowadays, if you write a detective story uh, and you have this detective figure uh, who is a loner, uh, maybe he smokes on a pipe, uh, you will always see the detective's figure is kind of reenacting 
Sherlock Holmes. There is always an assistant who is narrating the story and whenever this, this archetype is used, this pattern is used, then we can say this is a stock detective character. The girl next door, very, very stock character. So does that mean a stepmother is always terrible? No, but whenever a stepmother is present as a terrible person, torturing the stepchildren, then that character is a stock character. But when that stepmother becomes something different from the usual stock presentation of a stepmother, then she becomes a round character. So round characters are those which go against our idea of a character. They have multiple dimensions and they are simply very attractive because the way in which they are presented creates curiosity in us uh, as if we are exploring the character as the narrative progresses. Round characters have emotional depth and complexity. Uh, they are memorable, relatable. Uh, uh, you think about Winston Smith in 1984. He is a very round character. Gatsby in The Great Gatsby, Eustacia, why? She is the roundest character with all complexities possible in the Victorian era. But it's not that in Return of the Native only round characters are there. Clear Mobright is a round character very much. Eustacia, as I was telling you, is definitely round. So are there any stock characters there? Of course, the natives with their instinctive wisdom and the Flat characters in the novel, the riddle man, Thomas in your bride. See, their whole character is built on this single emotion of being good. So flat characters may be good characters, but their goodness, it doesn't have any dimension at all. They are so uniform and without any variation and with round characters, uh, you have more realistic characterization uh, because they are so unpredictable. They are like real human beings. You don't know what they're going to do the next moment because, well, they're round and they have so many shades to their characters. Now, based on development of a character in a novel or a story, we can have two kinds of characters. One is static and one is dynamic. Now, this is usually observable in a novel or long story or novella. In short stories, uh, since the span is so short, uh, we may not have this uh, categorization uh, that perceivable. Uh, but in novels, you definitely have these two kinds of characters. One is a static character and one is a dynamic character. Now, the word static, of course, it means it stays the same. Characters uh, who do not develop over time, no matter what happens to them, they remain the same. So They are static characters. Uh, usually flat characters are static characters because they don't have much dimension. So they do not change. But in some cases, even uh, round characters can you know, remain static. That means a character is very complicated, but it remains complicated in the same way. Or a character has um, many qualities. For example, Atticus Finch in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, he has a certain perspective uh, on race, on equality, on humanity, and he continues to have the same kind of perspective. They are all good perspectives. I'm not saying they are bad people. Often, round characters with a set of attitude to life who do not change over time, they give us this example of static round characters. Static flat character is easy to identify. You know, as I was telling you, most flat characters are static. Mr. Collins in Pride and Prejudice, he is static and flat and... Okay, Mr. Bounderby, static, flat, doesn't change in hard times. In hard times, we have so many flat characters and static characters that when we have a round character like Cecilia Jupe, how we stare in amazement at her. And that's the whole point of Dickens, to tell us that this is the only human being possible on earth. 
all the other characters which I am showing are so flat that they are robots. And how Louisa goes to that stature, how she becomes a round character through change is the whole point of our times. So all flat characters are static. Flat characters do not change. But all static characters are not flat. I am repeating it. All flat characters are static because they don't have any dimension based on which they will change. But all static characters are not flat because there are complicated characters, complex characters, round characters, human characters who do not change. Cecilia Jupe doesn't change, Luisa does. Now we come to the dynamic characters. Dynamic characters, they face complex situation and problems um, and they undergo transformation. From good to bad, from bad to good, doesn't matter, but they undergo transformation. And this transformation is not so much in terms of outward situation. Somebody getting poor from rich or somebody getting rich from poor, no, that's not transformation. Transformation is change in your attitude through a certain kind of realization, uh, some kind of growth, you know, in coming of age novels. You see how a child grows up to be an adult and how this act of development uh, involves a certain kind of emotional change. This is seen in Bildungsromans, Kunstler Romans, and whenever you have um, autobiographical stories, you have this quality of dynamism. And of course, this is more evident in case of postmodern and postcolonial novels than in case of Dickens's autobiographical novels, where uh, the characters are comparatively more static than today's heroes. Uh, for example, in case of R.G. in Funny Boy, we see such dynamism, such roundedness of character that is amazing. We don't see that much in Oliver Twist. But still, Oliver is far rounder and far more dynamic than other characters around him. Say Fagin, who is pretty, pretty flat. Not all round characters are dynamic. I told you just a few moments back, Atticus Finch, he is a round character, but he doesn't change. So he is not dynamic. But all dynamic characters are round. This is becoming like a, a, a class in philosophy and logic. <laughs> anyway, how to understand if a character is round and dynamic or round but not dynamic? Look at the character. Are they complex? Then they are round characters. Are they changing? Then they are dynamic characters. Are they both complex and changing? Then they are round and dynamic. An author has to give a greater effort in building characters who are round and even a greater effort in building characters who are dynamic. So don't think that a dynamic character uh, is one who runs around a lot. No, a dynamic character means who shows dynamism or any kind of activity when it comes to the mind, when it comes to the way you look at the world the way you judge the character. If your judgment changes, then that is also dynamic. Hamlet, Macbeth, see, Macbeth is an anti-hero, but he is a dynamic character because he changes. Almost all Shakespearean heroes act in a very round way. We have so many complex shades in them. Uh, comparatively, Shakespeare's characters in comedies his male characters in comedies, they are very much flat, often static. Whatever dynamism is seen, is seen in case of his women characters. Viola, so dynamic. And then Rosalind, Portia. Compare Portia with Bassanio, you know what I mean. As I was talking to you about Atticus Finch, that he is a round character but does not develop. So he is a round and static character. What about his daughter, Scout? 
Now the to kill a mockingbird is also a story in which we see the development of Scout from her early childhood you can say to uh, her teenage years. So this was a kind of coming of age novel. So in case of Scout it is both round and dynamic characterization because while her father's attitude doesn't change his attitude influences her change from innocence to understanding. So in the same book we have one round and static character in the father but round and dynamic character in the daughter. So we cannot say that an author is a good one or a bad one based on whether he is drawing flat characters or round characters or dynamic characters or static characters. Sometimes uh, these characterizations are very intentional. When the author wants you to focus on one or two characters, then obviously the other characters are drawn with less complex details so that your attention is not diverted. It's like on a stage when you watch a play or a dance performance, the central figures are given the spotlights and the people around them, they are more in a darker shade or they are not under the spotlight. Why? Because you need to focus on the main characters. So creating flat characters, stock characters, uh, these are part of narrative strategy you can say or strategy of the author but when the situation becomes something like there is absolutely no round character all the characters are stock characters it happens in case of fairy tales think about fairy tales where are the round characters there then that becomes a problem and that's why there are so many adaptations to them Use this knowledge, not just to answer questions like write a short note on stock characters. Uh, how are flat characters different from round characters or differentiate between dynamic and static. This is fine. This is fine for your literary terms paper. But use this knowledge to write answers such as analyze the character of Eustachia Y. Analyze the character of Lady Macbeth. So use this information in places where you see the question is on any character. Identify what kind of character that is. And if you think you uh, are not very sure about what kind of a character that is, you can of course ask me in the comment section. If I know about that character, I'll help you out. But if you use these terms in your answer, then of course that answer will have a much better impact when it comes to getting marks. So I hope today's class was useful to you and if it has been, please again I am asking you to subscribe because I really want you to stay connected with us. We are doing so many shots for you too. So if you want me to do any short video on any small thing, you know, a little clarification on something, a small little idea that you can give me because I am running out of them, please do that too in the comment section. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off and I'll see you in my next video which is going to be probably on, well, let's see, definition of tragic hero according to Aristotle, how tragic hero changes over time and what tragic hero means today in context of drama. So till my next video, all of you stay happy, stay subscribed. Thank you.